What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Ghost Cult Magazine podcast. I'm your host, Keefe. Today's podcast features an interview by DJ Astro Creep from our London office. DJ Astro Creep interviewed JP Gaster from Clutch, all about Clutch's big 2019 plans, some key anniversaries you may not be aware of, and their current tour behind their new album, Book of Bad Decisions, out now on Weathermaker Music. Check it out. Sat with John Paul now from Clutch. Pleasure to meet you today, John Paul. Very nice to meet you. It, it, it's, you've actually got two anniversaries this year, don't you? It's, uh, 10 years of Weathermaker and 25 years since Transnational Speedway League. Okay, yeah, yeah. I hadn't, uh, hadn't thought about the Weathermaker anniversary, but you're absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're. we're we're thrilled. Um, the the first record that, that we released, as you mentioned, was Transnational Speedway League. Um, that was a record that I think um, we learned a lot mm-hmm. on. Uh, we were a brand new band at the time, and we recorded in a studio called Razor's Edge Studio. And the reason we picked that studio was that uh, we'd heard some other recordings that came out of there that we were we were fans of. Uh, the Melvins recorded some records there, Lysol being one of them, uh, okay. Houdini being another one, uh, and Sleep's Holy Mountain was, was recorded there as well. Yeah. And um, those are still two bands that we very much you know look up to and, and uh, still enjoy listening to. And so we went to that studio and, and we tried to make a, a heavy record sort of in that kind of vein, I think. <laughs> and uh, it was a great learning experience. I mean, you know, I was slightly away from the, the normal style of a, a rock drummer. Have you been influenced by, say, jazz drummers or something like that, maybe? Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I um, very early on, I, I was uh, attracted to uh, that sound. Um, jazz drummers to me, even before I started playing drums. Um, I, I remember watching uh, either Buddy Rich or Gene Krupa or Tony Williams and these guys and watching what they did and thinking they were sort of superhuman in a way mm-hmm. and I still think that um, uh, for me Buddy Rich is is still uh, when you when you talk about technical virtuosity I still think he's untouchable certainly there are there are a new generation of sort of super drummers that are out there and talented in their own right but I, I still don't think anybody comes close to, to Buddy Rich when it comes to just just pure chops and energy um, and there were so many of the earlier rock drums like Bill Ward, Ginger Baker, obviously all came from that blues, almost jazzy kind of Absolutely. background as well. And I, and I think that was one of the, when I did start playing drums, one of my earliest uh, inspirations was Bill Ward from Black Sabbath. And, and I think one of the things that, that um, attracted me to his sound was, was that you could hear those jazz roots. And as a 16 year old who was just starting to figure all this stuff out, it blew me away. It blew me away that the guy that's in Black Sabbath knew about jazz. Mm-hmm. You know, as a 16 year old, I never I would have connected those dots. Yeah. And of course, the you know we know that the, those roots run very deep, not just for Bill Ward, but for, for all the band. You know, there's a, there's a great appreciation there for blues and jazz. Um, but as a 16 year old, that's just sort of like that just kind of rocks your universe. You're like, holy smokes, you know. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of sound was always interesting to me. Uh, you mentioned Ginger Baker. He's another one of my very favorite drummers. Um, an, another drummer that's very much steeped in, in the jazz tradition. Uh, Mitch Mitchell was another one. Yeah. And so from you know from those from those drummers, I started to dig deep, and I started to learn about more jazz drummers. And, and uh, I learned a lot about Elvin Jones and Tony Williams, Art Blakey, Philly Joe Jones, all these these great technicians. And um, it's it's very much a part of my sound. I, I feel like uh, a, a drummer sort of has a, a responsibility ability to um, dig a little bit and, and do the research because if, if you learn why there is a hi-hat and why there is a bass drum and what this thing a ride cymbal is and this hi-hat there's a reason for all that stuff and um, the drum kit started as a jazz instrument so I think it's important to at least learn a little bit about jazz because it'll it very much it for me it makes drumming easier yeah. Do you do anything different with your own kit? Are your toms a little bit higher, half, half 
um, the tuning, oh, tuning on the top. Um, the tuning on the top. Are you talking about the tuning? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, that for me, that's that kind of changes. Um, I, I definitely go for a very resonant tone, uh, and then as far as the pitch goes, sometimes that changes. Sometimes I'm more into uh, like that harder kind of bebop sound, and I'll go for a higher pitch thing. Um, right now, they they tend to be actually they're a little lower than than I've had them in the past, and I've been enjoying that. But at the key though for me is that they resonate and that there's there's an open sound. Um, I I have the same philosophy with cymbals. I don't have a lot of cymbals, but I really rely on those cymbals to give me a lot of sound. So if you if you play open drums, if you play big cymbals, um, you have the opportunity to make those make those instruments speak uh, above the band. Um, that, that for a band like us, we play quite loud. Yeah. So I, I need to have that extra headroom. So there's a reason why I have a 26 inch bass drum, and it's not just because it looks cool. It <laughs> does. It does look cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's a tool, and and for me, it's the right tool for the job. And and big cymbals are the same thing. It's the, those are the right tools. Um, the key though is being able to play those. You know, just because you have a 26 inch ride cymbal doesn't mean you beat the shit out of that 26 ride cymbal. You play that cymbal. Yeah. You guys tour all the time. Yeah, I'm surprised you actually get the time to stop and record a, a new album at any point. Uh, how's the uh, the material from Book of Bad Decisions gone down so far on the tour? Great. We very much enjoyed playing those songs. Um, the the tunes I feel like are are the best songs we've ever written and the, and the reason I say that is because we've enjoyed playing each one of those live um, okay. traditionally we record a record and um, maybe half of the songs sort of end up being in rotation and the other half you know after a year's worth of touring kind of are relegated to kind of a deep cuts catalog where we break them out every once in a while um, we've had a lot of fun on this tour because each one of the songs off of Bad, Bad Decisions has been in the set uh, numerous times and so that, that keeps it exciting and, and we're very we're happy with how how those songs play themselves live. You guys, you've, you've been touring on, as mentioned for years and years now as well. It was probably Beale Street was probably your biggest breakthrough certainly over here. I don't know about the states. How hard was it to keep on going at the beginning when it did take you that time to actually break through into the you know better known market? Well, you know the the growth of the band has been. Uh, very slow and with the exception of having a little bit of radio success with Electric Worry that was on Beale Street yeah. um, the, the band for the most part has has grown through word of mouth you know folks come to see the band play and hopefully they enjoy it and they tell their friends and so we get a few more folks coming out and a few more folks coming out um, that's been a, a big part of it and I, and I also think a, a, another big part of, of the reason the band has grown so slowly but so steadily um, is the fact that we were not afraid to tour with bands that didn't necessarily sound like us, okay. and that goes back very back to the old days. You know, we did uh, we did tours with Monster Magnet, we did tours with Prawn, we did tours with Bad Religion, uh, Pantera. Um, Marilyn Manson, you know, uh, Coheed and Cambria, even you know, a lot of a lot of bands that maybe people wouldn't necessarily associate with Clutch. Um, the the advantage to that, I think, is that uh, we have a very sort of wide ranging audience, and I think the people who come see our shows appreciate music in general. It's not just about a genre thing, you know. It's 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 very much about the live music experience, and um, we're very grateful for that. The, the first time I saw you guys was over in Liverpool, and uh, it was just over a thousand capacity venue. And tonight, I think it's two and a half thousand this in here, which I think is sold out. So that's a pretty good achievement in terms of the step up, as you said. <laughs> we're, we're very happy with that. <laughs> and during your downtime, the, probably the very little downtime you actually do have, do you get to go to many gigs yourself, or do you just move away from music? Uh, I, well, to be honest with you, in the last few months I haven't had much downtime at all. I, I do enjoy going to see live music. Um, you know, sometimes I'll even just go to the local pub and just go see what local rock bands are playing, you know, whoever that might be. Uh, I think it's important for uh, for us as musicians to continue to feed this thing, you know, this, this music, and you have to do that uh, by listening to music and being aware of other stuff, digging, like we were talking about before, doing some research, <laughs> and then, you know, going to see gigs when you can. And, because, um, you know, it's, it's not as if this is, this is just something that we sort of just turn on and turn off, you know. Um, for me personally, Personally, it's it's something that requires cultivation. You know, we have we have to give back to them. 
you've also involved yourself in producing some music now as well, haven't you? Mm-hmm. As, have you got any more of those projects planned? Uh, well, I recently recorded a record with Lion Eyes, and um, I, I, uh, I actually played drums on that record. And I've been producing those guys for many years, uh, very talented bunch of guys, and um, I had the opportunity to actually play on a record for the first time since I've known them. And so that was, that was an honor and a challenge. Uh, very much enjoyed that. Uh, I play with a blues guitarist back home called Mike Westcott. Um, he's uh, he's got a couple records out. Um, I'll be headed down to New Orleans in January to play with my buddy Mike Dillon and Johnny Vodakovich. I'm very excited about that. Um, I try to stay busy and I try to get into the projects that um, that are not my clutch. You know, it's it's for to you know to to get in a room with with uh, guys you know that make music that sounds just like clutch to me is an except not super exciting. You know, I'd much rather do something that's a little bit left field of that. Um, you actually did the couple of film scores, didn't you? I did. Yeah, I did. Uh, that was a, a completely different uh, ex- experience. The movie was called Fishing Without Nets, and uh, it is the story of Somali pirates. Okay. And the movie really turned out great. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to check it out, but uh, did, the, did, did the win an award at Sundance? Uh, I, it may have. I'm not. I'm not sure. I, I don't recall that. I, I know that. Um, it, it started out as sort of a, a, a small project, and by that I mean I think it was going to be a short film, maybe 20 minutes long, okay. and the thing sort of just took on a life of its own. Uh, a friend of mine named Kevin Hillier, uh, who plays in a band back home called Caverns that we had gone on tour with, um, he, he does quite a bit of that kind of thing, and he, he uh, asked me to, to uh, score a couple scenes, and so I played percussion. Um, while I sort of watched these these scenes, one of them was a, a scene where they're loading this boat full of supplies. The pirates are. And it was, uh, that was a great thrill. You know, that's some, that was something new for me to be able to watch a movie and you know hear the stuff that I recorded in my basement be on the soundtrack. It was uh, art music for bass as well, which is a, a more kind of jazzy project. Yes, yeah, that's uh, Jay Turner, and uh, he is an incredibly talented man. A uh, uh, very, very. Uh, he he plays the other stuff, <laughs> you know. He never plays what you think he's going to play, uh, and playing playing his songs are a great challenge because when he brings the ideas to me, they are they are very loose, and um, it, it it requires a different kind of thought process. And so each record that I've done with him, um, I've learned something from, and I, I very much enjoy playing playing with him. With obviously you you do need different projects on top of the clutch stuff. Is there any kind of different type of song that you'd like to cover for any of them? Say maybe a pop song or something like that. Uh, well, oddly enough, we have we over the last year we've been working on a few covers. Um, most of them are, are sort of more in the rock vein, but we were discussing that the other night. It might it might be fun to try covering some songs that maybe aren't necessarily rock songs, um, and sort of put our twist to those and. and what that means exactly at this point, I'm not really sure what shape that will take. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, it's it's all about trying to do new stuff. You know, we, we I, th- I think we sort of thrive on that. And the more you do that, the, the more it just sort of, it makes the clutch sound even richer, I think. Well, I think a lot of the 80s pop music had a lot of guitars in it anyway, even stuff like Madonna to an extent. Yeah. I mean, it, it all had that kind of basis before Stock Aiken and Waterman came in and then just made the you know, four or five chords, keyboards. Right, I agree. There was, you know, I'll tell you what, there was a Duran Duran song that came on the other night uh, and I was blown away by the bla- uh, by the bass line. Um, there's, yeah, there's some heavy grooves out there and you, it, 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 sometimes you don't think about it like that, but it's all, it's all good stuff. Is there anything that you can still love to do? You know, a particular festival you love to headline, anything like that? Um, well, we, we are we do have a festival run coming up this summer. We're going to be over here uh, for a few of those. One of those is going to be uh, uh, Hellfest. We're excited for that. We're going to be on download this year. We're excited for that. Um, Copenhagen is another one that we're excited for. The, the festivals are cool because they, they give us the opportunity to play for new people. And I, I think we are 
one of the few bands out there that can kind of play with just about any kind of band and appeal to different folks. You know, we have done uh, we've done festivals with Venom, and we've done festivals with the Whalers, Bob Marley's band. So, and both of them were great. You know, so I, we're we're proud of that. Okay, so finally, uh, what would you say is the next big step for yourself or for Clutch? Well, we, uh, there's going to be more touring coming up. We're going we're to support Book of Bad Decisions some more. We're going to record some more songs as well. And then um, and then we're going to sort of figure out what, what, what the next step is. You know, this, this idea of, of uh, recording full-length records, um, I, I am sure that we will continue to do that. But we might play around with just releasing a few songs at a time in a singles kind of a fashion. Okay. Um, just to see what, what that might be look like yeah. maybe a slightly different direction for you have been perhaps happy. yeah and, and that's the cool thing I think about streaming now if, if you know what if the artist can kind of embrace this idea you know sort of like all bets are off you know, you, a, a band can record whatever the heck they want and it doesn't even necessarily have to be part of their live set. It could just be a song that they think is interesting and cool, and you put it up there, and who knows what kind of life it'll take on. So um, while, while the streaming industry is, is frustrating at times because the revenue is not there like it used to be, it also does open up a lot of avenues to where you can you can hopefully um, put your music in front of folks that, that, that might not have heard it, usually. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time today. I know you're going to be quite busy, so we'll let you get going. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Great, great hanging out. Thanks for checking out today's podcast. Follow, like, and subscribe wherever you hear these podcasts. Also check out Ghost Cult Magazine on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And finally, check us out at ghostcultmag.com. We're out. Peace.